Good morning. Man, that was a wimpy. Good morning. There we go. Much better. Welcome back to week three of our series, All In, as we talk about the health of our church as we move into a new ministry season this fall. So far, we've talked about being all in for each other, and last week we talked about being all in for connection, and we actually kicked off our connection groups last week, one group meeting on Tuesday and three on Wednesday, and we had 47 adults connected in groups, and we had 32 kids and leaders connected in Awana Club, so uh, over 75 kids and students and adults connected in a midweek discipleship experience, which is awesome. If you're not yet in a connection group, I want to encourage you to join one. You can sign up at Connecting Point or you can sign up through the Church Center app. But I would encourage you to get into a group so that you can begin connecting together with other people. Now today we're talking about being all in for the one. It's something that we've talked a lot about the last few years. And we've seen God do some incredible things as we've made a commitment as a church, individually, to pursue the one in our own lives. And if you're not sure what a one is, let me explain. A one is someone in your life who does not yet have a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going to talk more about what that is in a moment. But first I want to celebrate what God has done the last few years as we've instilled this value as a church. Our last fiscal year, our fiscal years run October 1 through September 30th, so we're about to come to the end of another one here in a few weeks. But last fiscal year, we had four people who were someone's one who made a decision for Christ and followed him in baptism. This fiscal year, we have four, un- four additional people who have made a commitment to Christ and gotten baptized. So that's eight people in the last two years who were someone's specific one, someone that they were caring for, praying for, and sharing their story with that have stepped from death to life because we have made it a priority as a church to pursue the one. And we've done an awesome job over the last few years as a church on our evangelism efforts and Love Out Loud. And I want to share with you some NCD, our Natural Church Development Survey we take every year, Some results from it in the area of evangelism. One of the categories is called need-oriented evangelism. It's actually the highest uh, score on our survey this year. We got a 77 on it, which is awesome. But as I look at this graph, there's a few things that I notice about it. First, that 58 uh, says, I know a number of individuals in our church who have the gift of evangelism. Well... As you can see, we're above average, but not quite high, and that is because we need to do a better job of understanding what gifts we have and how those gifts are used to serve the body of Christ, and we're going to talk a lot about that next week. Right next to it, the 59, I try to deepen my relationship with people who do not yet know Christ. That one was very low a few years ago. And so it's very exciting for us to see that score go up. That means that we are making it a priority. You are making it a priority in your life to actually reach out to people who do not know Jesus and have a deeper relationship with them so that you can share the gospel. Now we have some high ones, the 80 on there, the evangelistic activities of our church are relevant to my friends and family who do not yet know Jesus. There's a 78, the leaders of our church support the individualistic Christian evangelistic endeavors. Uh, There's a 77, we encourage new Christians in our church to begin evangelism immediately. And then there's a 75, 76, our our church tries to help those who need food, clothing, education, counseling, etc. And there's a lot of creativity in the evangelistic efforts of our church. Since we began taking this survey three years ago, we've scored pretty high in a lot of those church-related categories. What I'm really excited about is that our scores are going up in these individual categories. This 67 that's on this side of the graph says, I pray for my friends, colleagues, and relatives who do not yet know Jesus Christ that they will come to faith. That score has gone up quite a bit. 
And so I'm very excited to see that we are beginning to make this a priority in our individual lives, not just something that we do as a church. It's actually becoming who we are as a people. It's part of our DNA. That is what we're called to do as God's people. We are called to go into all the world and make disciples. And so today, I want to look at this idea of the one a little bit differently than we have before. When we think about a one, we often think about a word that has many different meanings. The word one has a lot of different meanings. One of those meanings for the word one is an amount. So think about money. If I were to offer you a dollar to come up here and tell us the best joke you have, how many of you would take me up on that offer? Okay, a few of you, right? Now, if I decided to change from $1 to one $100 bill, how many of you would change your mind and decide to come up and try to tell a joke? Yeah, a lot more hands, right? So we assess value, we, we assess the amount of something with the word one. The word one indicates the amount we have of something. But it's also a word that we use to rank things. Like, who is the best? What is the greatest? Who is number one? For instance, if I were to ask you, who is the number one professional football team there is, you would say, oh, you're not very excited about it, so I guess not the Chiefs, right? How many of you would say the Chiefs is the number one? Now, I know nothing about football. I care nothing about football. But I did look it up, and actually, currently, at this moment, you are correct. They are the number one professional team currently, all right? So hopefully they stay that way for your benefit. I could care less. But we rank things like who is the best football team, what is the best band, uh, what is our favorite music. We use the word one to rank things, right? But we also use the word one to rank are, we use the word one to describe something that is one of a kind. For instance, I googled some items this week on uh, what is one of a kind items for sale, which I don't suggest you do because you'll bring up some results that are pretty nightmarish, okay? Some pretty scary things out there if you type in one of a kind things for sale. But I did find one that was interesting. It's this picture of this, uh, or these little squirrels, right? Uh, they're little squirrel wedding toppers. You can buy them on Etsy. They look very realistic, very well done. And if there's something you're interested in, I'm sure you could, I could give you the Etsy shop name. Uh, they're pretty affordable, only $950. Yeah, I mean, they're one of a kind though, guys. They're one of a kind, okay? So we use the word one to describe the amount. We use the word one to rank things. We use the word One, to describe things that are one of a kind. And you might be wondering, hey, why are we talking about the ways we use the word one? Who cares? Well, that's because that's how the Bible describes God. See, Scripture tells us there is only one God, that God is number one, and that He is truly one of a kind. So go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy. It's in the New Testament, near the back of your Bible. We're going to read a few different verses out of 1 Timothy chapter 2 today. So you're looking for big number 2. We're going to start uh, in 1 Timothy 2, 5. And I want to talk about the oneness of God. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So just leave your Bible open to that. There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So there is only one God. The first, pers- the first part of this verse makes it very clear there's only one God. Not two, not ten, not ten thousand different gods. And it would be easy for us to judge people in our culture or people from other religions who believe things like that, that there are just thousands of gods, right? The reality is it's actually a very common belief in our culture that there are many gods or that we are God. I was listening to a YouTube video uh, just yesterday, I believe, um, and it was going through some progressive pastors and what they were saying. And this guy, this guy got up, he said he was a pastor, and he said, I am God, and you are God, and we are God, 
and we are all God together. That's a common belief in our culture. We might not want to admit it, but there's a common thread in our culture that there is not one God. There are many gods, and, and we might be God, right? So maybe there's eight billion gods. But Scripture makes it clear there is one God. But if we are honest with ourselves, we have made many things in our life God. We might not call it that, but if we are honest, we prioritize many things in our life above God. It comes in the form of money or sports or pleasures in our lives. Now, we don't physically bow down to these things, at least I hope you don't. But we often create gods or idols in our lives by placing things in that ultimate place of importance in our lives. They may not be statues made of stone, but when we put our jobs or entertainment or our family or our relationships or our finances above God, we've created an idol or a false god in our lives. And when Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, that's exactly what their culture was like. It's very similar to ours. There were a lot of different gods that people were worshiping. And Paul tells Timothy, hey, don't listen to the culture, Timothy. Don't buy into the lie that they're telling you that there's many gods. Don't buy into the lie that you might be God. But I need you to understand, Timothy, there is one God. The true God. He is the first, He is the best, and He is one of a kind. There's another place in Scripture that tells us about only one God, the God of Scripture, and it's written in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5. God says, I am the Lord, there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. See, God's Word makes it really clear. There is only one God. And anything else that claims to be God in our lives, anything else we put in place of God in our lives is merely a cheap counterfeit. But many of us will go through life chasing the perfect job, the perfect family, the perfect spouse, the perfect kids, the perfect life, and we have placed something in our life above God, and we're chasing after it, trying to fill that God-sized hole in our life. And the truth is, it can't be done. Because as we pursue the perfect life, the perfect marriage, the perfect job, the perfect kids, we end up finding ourselves to be empty. Our lives are very empty. That's a place that only God can fill. And when we chase those things, we will always come up empty because there's only one thing that can fill that place in your life. It's God. Those things are the gods of this world. And everything in us wants to pursue them. All of us, at one point or another, are pursuing something in our life above God. When you look at other religions, and even in our culture, they are worshiping gods that are distant and detached. But that's not how God is. God is personal and therefore concerned in the affairs of mankind. The God of the Bible is known for His love. And you'll hear that a lot in culture. We talk, we'll talk about this more in our series in a few weeks called What is Love? But 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. And our culture loves to say that. Hey, if God is love, then, then why would God let bad things happen? Hey, if God is love, then why would God send people to hell? They misunderstand what love is. If you're confused at what love is, or you're not sure who God is, there's a perfect definition of it in 1 Corinthians 13. So if you want to know what God is like, because God is love, then just read that. Not only is God love, but He loves us so much that He wants to have a relationship with us. The God of the universe, the one who put the planets in place, the creator of all things, wants to have a personal relationship with you. And if that is not an overwhelming feeling, then there's something wrong. How do I know that the God of creation wants to have a relationship with me? Well, look at our 1 Timothy passage and go back one verse. 1 Timothy 2, 4. God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
Now, we use that word saved a lot in church. It's kind of a churchy word. But it means that the God of creation wants a relationship with you. He wants that relationship to be made right so that we can spend eternity with Him. God wants us to know the one true God. He wants to have a personal relationship with us. But the question is that many people in our culture are asking is why can't I just have that relationship with God from the beginning? Why do I need to be saved? What's wrong with my relationship with God that it needs to be made right? That's what many people in our culture are asking. They're asking, well, if God loves me so much, why can't he just have a relationship with me? What's wrong with me that God won't have a relationship with me? And if you've been in church for a while, you know the answer to that is sin. Sin is why God cannot have a relationship with you. If you've heard that word before, you might be thinking, you know, the really bad stuff like murder and terrorism and things like that. But that's not actually what sin is. See, sin is anything that goes against God's standard. And God is holy and His standard is perfection. But because of our sin, we could never achieve perfection on our own. In fact, Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That glory we fall short of is God's holiness. And our sin separates us from God because of His holiness, because He is holy. Scripture tells us because of our sin, because we disobey, we deserve to be punished. There are consequences for our actions. And that's something that our culture struggles with. Why do we have to have consequences for our actions? If God loves us, then we shouldn't have to worry about the consequences, right? But think about it as a parent-child relationship. When my kid messes up, there's consequences, right? All three of my kids got grounded this week. Consequences, right? Do I enjoy those consequences? No, because then I have to deal with the whining because of the consequences. But I give them consequences because when they do something wrong, they need to be punished, not because I don't love them. They need to be punished because I do love them. Because I know if they continue down that path, they continue that same behavior over and over and over again, eventually they're going to end up hurt. And so I've got to put some consequences in place to help them to know that what they're doing is wrong, that they're going to end up hurt because of it. There are consequences to our actions. Romans 6.23 says the wages or consequences of our sin is death. But... The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, many people will ask the question, if God loves us, why would He send us to hell? How could a loving God send people to hell? The reality is He doesn't. God doesn't send people to hell. Hell wasn't created for us. Hell was created for Satan. And when we sin... We're not just disobeying God, we're actually following Satan. Hell is a very real place, and we are already on the road there because of our sin. It is a God who loves us so much that He wants to take us off that path and put us on a new one. God doesn't want us to go to hell. And so he made a way for us to get off the path that we're already on. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Not only is there one God, but there is only one way to him. Through God's Son, Jesus Christ. See, Jesus serves as our mediator, our go-between between God and And us, because of our sin, God knew that we couldn't fix the problem on our own. There's nothing that we can ever do to earn our salvation. Because of our sin, we deserve a punishment. That punishment is death. There are consequences for our actions. That's another difference between Christianity and our culture's understanding 
of God. See, we can't do anything to get to heaven. We're never going to be good enough. That punishment, which is death for our sin, must be paid by us or by someone else. So we're already on the path to hell, but God loves us so much, He doesn't want to leave us on that path. So what does He do? He takes on flesh and lives a perfect life. And then Jesus died on the cross and rose again, dying in our place for our sin because He never sinned. Jesus paid our punishment for our sin so that our relationship with God could be restored. If you read on in 1 Timothy 2, verse 6, it says, Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. See, Jesus rescued us from our sin. Not that we're not going to keep sinning. We will. But sin without payment leads us dead and without hope. And if it stung a little when I said, hey, you know, if you disobey God, you're not just disobeying God, you're actually following Satan. If that stung a little bit, you're like, ah, I don't like that. Well, just read Ephesians 2, verse 1 and 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. See, when we disobey God, we're following the ways of this world. Who is the ruler of this world? Satan. So we as sinners are following Satan. But Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us over to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Which leads us to the one question that we all must ask. If there's only one God, and there's only one way to get to Him, Jesus, then what are we going to do with this Jesus? Because this goes far beyond just knowing some stuff about Jesus. It goes far beyond in believing facts about Jesus. James 2.19 says, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. See, there comes a point in your life when you need to personally decide what you are going to do with Jesus, how you are going to respond to Jesus. Today, you're going to have the opportunity to do that. To believe in Jesus and accept His sacrifice on the cross in your place for your sin. See, there's only one God, and He exists in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are each God and are co-equal working in everything. God wants to have a relationship with you. He loves you so much that He came to earth, took on flesh, and paid your penalty for sin. And that sacrifice comes with a promise. John 1, 12 says, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. See, when we accept His sacrifice, we have the opportunity to join His family, the church. We have the the promise of eternal life when we die. And we get to spend eternity with Him, not at some later date, but right now today. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, eternity with God begins today. That relationship with Him begins today. That's the question I want to ask you. What are you going to do with Jesus? If you don't know what it means to have a personal relationship with God, then in a moment when we continue singing, I want to invite you to come down to the front and talk with someone about it. What are you going to do with Jesus today? But I know there are many in the room who've already accepted Christ. Christ is already Lord of your life. You already have a relationship with Him. And my question to you is the same. What are you going to do with Jesus? 
See, if He really is your Lord, if He really is your Savior, then what are you going to do about it? You know the truth. Good for you. So do the demons. You believe the truth about Jesus, that He really is God's Son. Good for you. So do the demons. I don't see them out telling other people about Jesus. I don't see them out pursuing the ones in their lives. So how are you different than the demons? That's the question. There's a story I heard often as a kid about a a man named Charles Blondin. And Charles was this incredible tightrope walker. And one day he decided he was going to walk a tightrope across Niagara Falls which is 160 feet in the air, and the distance was a quarter of a mile. And so he gets to Niagara Falls that day, and the crowd begins to gather. They heard that he was going to walk this tightrope. And on either side, there's this crowd who's getting excited as he gets ready to take that first step. And he steps out on the line. And he walks across and walks back. And the crowd erupts in a cheer. They are so excited. They just watched this guy walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. And he says, but wait a minute. grabs a wheelbarrow then he picks up some rocks and he begins to load the wheelbarrow he gets behind the wheelbarrow and he squares up to the line and the crowd is just they're so excited they're this guy's about to walk across a tightrope over Niagara Falls pushing a wheelbarrow full of rocks. So he steps out on the line, he begins pushing the wheelbarrow, he pushes it all the way across and all the way back. And the crowd is just going crazy. They're so excited. How could this guy do that? And when he gets back across, he begins taking back out those rocks. And at this point, the crowd is just so excited. What is he about to do? And he says, hey, do you believe that I can walk across this line with someone in the wheelbarrow? And they're like, yeah, that would be awesome. We would love to see that. And he's like, all right, who wants to get in? The crowd falls silent. See, no one was willing to get in the wheelbarrow. They watched him walk across the line with nothing and come back. They watched him walk across the line with a wheelbarrow full of rocks and he came back. They believed that he could walk across the line with someone in the wheelbarrow, but none of them were willing to get in. If you're not actively caring for and praying for, and sharing the story of what Jesus has done in your life with one person in your life every week so that they will have a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ, then how are you different than any spectator on the side who believed he could walk across but was unwilling to get in? See, if you believe Jesus Christ is Lord, and you've accepted Him as Lord, but you're unwilling to get in, you're unwilling to go out and tell other people about Jesus, then you're just a spectator. How are you different than the demons? They believe too. They know who Jesus is. They shudder at His presence. 
So the question is, what are you going to do with Jesus? If you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day. But if you have, and you're unwilling to get in the wheelbarrow and tell other people about him, you're nothing more than a spectator. So what are you going to do with Jesus? God, I'm so grateful for your son. That he would love a sinner like me. That he would die in my place for my sin. That he'd be willing, because of his deep love for me, to pull me off the path to hell that I'm already on. And put me on the path to a relationship with him. God, I'm so grateful. God, I know what I would do with Jesus. Help me have the courage to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.